What's going on YouTube? I got a very, very, very special video for you guys today. So get you a drink, get you a snack, and get ready, because it's finna go down. It's the weird perspective. Let's go. All right, all right. So the moment everybody's been waiting for, I have a very special guest that I'm happy to introduce. Um, been knowing him for a long time. He's actually married to my sister. Um, we don't get a chance to spend a lot of time together because they live in a different state. But uh, he's a friend. He's family. I want you guys to welcome Yanel Jordan to the Wood Perspective. How you doing, bro? I'm doing great, man. It's, it's always great to see you. I certainly appreciate it, um, you inviting me. So this is great. Awesome. Love it. Yeah, man. I'm super excited to have you on. Um, just to give you a quick little background, what what brought this along, right? I was watching, uh, just chilling on the couch, watching ESPN. Um, and then I came across the uh, the Bills. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they got a special on ESPN. So I was like, man, I'm going to check this out. So I normally don't get a chance to really watch sports because I'm I'm so busy, but I'm like, man, let me watch this. And then it reminded me, I was like, yo, you never played in one of those Super Bowls. And so I was like, man, let me let me get in contact with this brother, <laughs> man, and, and chop it up with him to see um, just I want to his experience, your perspective, your understanding, everything that you've been through when it comes to the bills. And so we're going to dive into those things. I really want to get into that. But um, I wanted to, uh, for the people to get to know you, your name is, this is your Nail Jordan, uh, ex-NFL player, um, played in the 1994? It was the 93, uh, was it 94? Yeah, I think, I don't even remember anymore. I think it was the 93 Super Bowl, so. A 93 or 94 Super Bowl, it was the fourth Super Bowl, right, that the Bills went to. Yeah. Um, with how you've been doing with everything that's going on, COVID, um, how you guys holding up? How's the family? You know, we're doing great. I mean, considering um, everything that's happened, I mean, it's definitely a situation where it's not something that was expected, but in terms of just being able to just manage your day-to-day -day things and, you know, being grateful, you know, grateful that um, our family is safe. And at the same time, we've had some losses, but we do understand that as, you know, you tend to appreciate life even more, you know? And, I'm, I just count my blessings. Every single day we pray, we do all the things that, you know, to us that's important and that's family first and keeping it and keeping the main things, the main thing, which is like, you know, giving God all the glory and not focusing on material things. And one thing that we've learned a lot in this uh, past few years is how precious life is. So we try to make every, I mean, we make every day count. You know, make every day count. So be grateful for every day, each and every single day. Amen, amen. That's 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 the most important. Spending time with family. How's uh how's my nephews holding up over there? They get big, great, man. man. They, they, they get big. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting big, man. I mean, your you know your oldest is already taller than uh, Rashida, so than my wife. So wow. Yeah. Thir <laughs> thir Thirteen, right? Thirteen. No, going to be 13 soon. He's still 12. Oh, man, dude. He's, he's already, yeah. He's, yeah, I got my 12-year-old, and I'd be like, you got to stop growing. You better stop it. I, I'm definitely not trying to <laughs> continue to, it seems like every day she grows an inch, man. And it's, yep. uh, but it's just, it's amazing to see them grow up to uh, just the experience and then the time that we get to share with them. So it's exactly. an amazing thing. So um, how you guys adjusting to the new city? You know, we love it. I mean, that's like one of the best decisions we ever made. And we think that we just, we're just grateful and thank God that we are here today. And I know that at the time when we did it, we didn't know what was gonna happen, but we, we essentially got here a few months before the pandemic started. So it was just the timing of it couldn't have been better. So everything worked out great for us. And we love it, the kids love it. Basically, we're just enjoying this moment right now while we can. Yeah, yeah we gotta get out there before uh, and visit you guys before things get worse. <laughs> and next thing you know, we can't travel. So, but we definitely, uh, you guys are on our list of places that we want to be. I've never been down there. So I definitely want to come and visit. I got some other family down there as well. They're waiting for me to come out there too. So 
Uh, definitely, definitely, we're gonna visit really soon. We're gonna set that up. Um, but tell the people a little bit uh, about you, your upbringing. You know the the where you're from, and uh... yeah, sure, sure, man. It's like you know, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and you know, in terms of uh, my upbringing, it's kind of uh, weird because I traveled a lot of places and live in a lot of places. So I, even though I was born in um, Brooklyn, New York, I didn't live there. You know. At first, uh, my parents are Haitians, so they sent us to Haiti, meaning that my older brother and I, we lived in Haiti for like eight or nine years, and they wanted us to learn about the culture, and they felt like it was a little bit, you know, um, safe for, the, for us to be where we were, because in Brooklyn, where we lived, it was kind of rough a little bit, so we had to uh, make some adjustment, but after, um, you know, after I want to say I was about 11 to 12 or so, when our parents decided to just bring us in the state, we lived in New York for a while, but the area where we lived was kind of rough. Um, you know, a lot of um, gang, gang activities and, you know, people getting stabbed. And at the time, people didn't really shoot each other as much. But in terms of um, being stabbed, that was something that was constantly happening. So they decided to just, um, you know, pack up and leave and say, you know, we're going to move to the um, north suburb of Chicago. And this is how we ended up um, going to Everson. Um, I have one of my aunts that actually lived there. And we stayed with her for like a couple of months until we could find our own place. And that's how it all started, man. Just, um, I'm just grateful that my parents made that move and put us in a better situation where we could take advantage, not only of the school system, but just to be in a place where we could actually go to school and focus on just, you know, our academics versus um, constantly worrying about what's going to happen to you. So, yeah, so I'm, so I'm grateful. So what, so what age did you guys move? So you said you, you were born in Brooklyn. And then what age did you guys move to uh, Haiti? I, I think I was about one when they sent me. So I don't even okay. remember. But I know that I spent most of my childhood in Haiti. But we used, I, we used to travel back and forth uh, to, to New York all the time. So every summer, we would spend like two or three months in New York okay. and then go back to Haiti. So that went on for like, you know, 10 years before we finally decided to just um, go ahead and, you know, um, I didn't decide, but my parents decided to basically uh, make us um, stay in New York at the time. And once it got rough, then we eventually moved to, um, you know, Everson, which is- Okay. Um, okay. So you didn't get the opportunity to, to, to uh, adapt the uh, the lingo. Did you talk like that? Yo, what's up, son? Oh, no, nah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a little bit of everything. So, you know- <laughs> Yeah, when I first met you, uh, first thing that stood out to me was I instantly knew like uh, uh, your accent. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's a weird accent because it's like it's not quite French, but it's not you know it's not quite um, Southern or you know whatever. I have a little bit of um, different accents, so when people always say, "Where are you from?" I'm like, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> I, I mean, I've lived in so many different places, man. It's not even funny. But yeah, you know, yeah. it's what it is, man. That's life sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Um, and so you you lived in uh in Evanston. How was how was Evanston? I mean, I, I've I've hung out in Evanston quite a few times, uh, especially during my high school year. So I got pretty familiar with the area pretty fast. And it was in a transition of changing um when I was in high school. There was like a little small, rough part, but for the most part, it was a pretty good neighborhood over there. Uh, how was Evanston for you? Everson was actually pretty cool, man, because um, that was like the first time we got a chance to stay in a place where it was like quiet, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, you could go out and basically hang out and nothing would happen to you. I mean, you, you had your moments, but for the most part, Everson was a great place to, you know, grow up in and and being ex exposed to just different cultures and different, different uh, you know, background in terms of um, the people that you meet and people just essentially we had no 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 um connection to your past meaning that they have no way of relating to it but at the same time you had people that were open and inviting and i had friends that i met and till this day we're still friends so that's a great thing and i would say that everson was probably one of the best places that knowing now and looking back that we moved we moved to and it was a great place to actually grow up in you know you had the north side of Everson, which is a, a very, you know, affluent um, area. And then you had, you know, other parts of Everson that was a little bit rough, but not too rough. And at the same time, 
where we live, which is almost like in the central part of Everson, it was like perfect because we got a chance to mingle with just about people from different different um, background. And it was okay. You know, the school, it was like one main school, which is the big, um, you know, high school. Everson High School? Everson High School. You get to meet with different individuals. And at the same time, you have the opportunity to just go to school and learn and grow and have the opportunity to just, you know, do what you do what you have to do. Yeah, I ran, we ran, I ran track, we ran track against them, even though they were uh, necessarily a suburb, but they were still in the red, which is the division my high school was in. So we, we ran track against you guys uh, quite a few times. I think we played ball against you guys maybe once or twice too. Um, okay. But yeah, that's, that's pretty dope. Yeah, I remember those days, so many memories running through my head right now, of the time that I got to spend in Neveston just running around being a, being a knucklehead. Um, so how did your, how did you, uh, your love for football, how did football come about? You know, football was not even a sport that I, I really loved when I was little because all I remember that uh, when I was little, we had our aunt who loved football and they used to watch the Dallas Cowboys all the time. Wow. And for some reason, that always stuck in my head because I never really gravitated towards football. If anything, you know, soccer was, is like the big thing if you go to any country, you know, mm -hmm. any other country outside of the U.S., soccer is like the big thing. So... I started playing soccer when I was little and I always had fun doing it, but never really thought about football. And I remember, um, you know, after we had graduated um, eighth grade and trying to go to high school. And the reason why I even went out for the football team is because somebody, I think somebody dared me or something like that. And, you know, it's almost like, you <laughs> say, well, what, what are you going to, what are you, what sports are you going to play? I'm like, I don't know. Let me just, wow. you know, just something. And, and a couple of my friends went out for football. I'm like, okay, I'll go ahead and try. I mean, I didn't know anything about football. People don't realize that. I didn't really know anything in terms of position, in terms of nothing at all. And because I never really followed it. Because I usually I used to watch soccer all the time. Wow. So man. It was kind of funny. My first year, I was an offensive lineman. <laughs> <laughs> wow, for real? I mean, people don't realize that I used to play offensive lineman. I played offensive lineman and defensive lineman. I played um um, defensive end or defensive tackle to different I mean I it was just funny because my first year it was just like it was like a learning a learning type of year where my athleticism you know allowed me to do different things but because I was a big kid for you know for a high schooler because I was like 5'10 160 pound wow. you know in high school you're like okay that's big and I was able to just basically you know learn the game as I, you know, as I was just on the field. Wow, that's cool. My mom didn't let me play football. I played basketball <laughs> and I ran track. And I actually, uh, she was to be mad at me, but I was like gonna forge her signature so I can play. <laughs> um, but yeah, she wasn't having that. So she said, I, mean, I was too small. Cause I was like, what was I? Five, seven, five, six. Uh, like 160 pounds. I was a little bit more stockier when I was smaller, but I had amazing speed. And so, but I didn't know anything about football besides how we used to play in the in the backyard, get the ball and run. <laughs> so the first couple practices, it was hitting me. I was fumbling. I was dropping the ball. They were like, you got to wait until you're all the way down before you let the ball go. So <laughs> I was terrible. I was oh, terrible. Funny. But the coach was like, man, I'm willing to work with you because you got speed. And um, he's like, you just have to hold on to the ball. <laughs> you said it right there, speed. I mean, I was a big guy, but I, I was always fast. So it's like, you know, you have a big kid that can run. So they're like, yeah, let's put him on the line and have him block. So, and I'm like, okay, fine. I didn't really know anything. So I said, okay, I, I'll, I'll block. And so I became great at blocking. And that eventually evolved to the point where, um, you know, my sophomore year, I started doing more and more you know, blocking, and then they say, you know, something says you can block and you big, maybe we should try you at, um, you know, fullback. So I was playing fullback and I was on, and I also was playing defense. And before you know it, because one of the things that, one of the things that I know that in terms of me, it's like, I'm, I'm not saying that to, you know, to be a uh, boast for anything, but I'm, I was always very athletic, so I could do anything just about, if you just tell me what to do and I would do it. Even to the point where by the time I finished playing my senior year, I basically played just about every position in the football field. Wow. Because um, I, was, I, was, I was the kicker. 
kicker I too. Back, I was the backup kicker, so I used I used wow. to kick the kickoff. That's funny. People don't realize I used to kick the kickoff, and I used to be the punt. I'm the I was the backup punter as well too. But we had a great punter. His wow. name was Peter Lewis. Uh, but I was the backup punter, and I like I said, I played just about everything. I I played receiver. I played defensive back. I even tried quarterback in practice. Just about all the line position. I mean, I did it all, man. And and by the time my senior year, I never left the field while I was while I was playing football because I played in all the special team and I basically stayed on the field because I would kick off and basically then I would go into defense. Then I was the we I was the um, uh, punt returner, so I stayed there too if they had to kick, <laughs> if they had to punt, and I was the kickoff returner. So I basically stayed on the field. The entire time, and That's I started insane. on defense and offense, <laughs> so I never really left the field. Oh, so People your stamina, your that. stamina was like top tier. Your stamina, yeah. I, I was because I ran track, so it basically kept me in shape. I was in shape the entire time. I was always in shape, so I just, I just stayed on the field. I never really had a problem when it comes to that. So I was just, I just got used to it. I never even thought about it because to me, I thought I was just the norm. Yeah, Not realizing that, you know, most people were taking breaks. I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I think I think as kids, man, we, we we just play. We just play. We don't think about how tired we are. We're going to push through. We'll run upstairs at the crib, grab some water. We right back out there. Like, we don't. I just think exactly. about all those days because I used to play, like, nothing official, but I used to play baseball. We played okay. kickball. We played soccer. I grew up in a pretty diverse neighborhood. So I used to play all those sports, too, and we come out. To, to sun up to sun down we're outside yep. running around and so we don't we're not keeping track of time we're not like how tired we are we're just playing and uh that's exactly. an amazing thing about exactly. about being a kid man i uh, i miss those days i wish my kids would i had a similar childhood to how i grew up i had yeah. so many childhood memories it's, of that it's different. yeah it's very yeah. different now how was uh how was playing track i mean the uh, running track how was that Running track was great because I've always enjoyed running. Even now, I still run. So I've always enjoyed running and I never stopped. And it's funny because um, and the track coach that we had in my in, um, middle school was also an assistant coach at the high school. So he was already talking to the coach about me before I even got there. So by the time I, you know, by the time I went to my first practice, the coaches already knew who I was. And they had, you know, they had talked about me in terms of, because we usually have this like district um, race we would do every summer. Mm. And we had done so well in that they already knew who I was and I just didn't know they knew me. So by the time I got on the track, it was like a no brainer. They was like, yeah, you're going to do this. You're going to do that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, from the day, from day one, the minute I just tried out for the hurdles, it was a done deal. <laughs> and that's what you did was the hurdles i did the hurdles i did high jump my freshman year i did all the sprints um you name it i did it man <laughs> I, I didn't I, I tried hurdles i was like no you gotta have be tall with long legs to pull that off uh um, yeah. i was like no nah, i'm not I'm not good at hurdles <laughs> but i did the 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 well in high school we, we were doing the 100 meter uh okay. the 200 meter relay that's what i did okay. um I wasn't gonna try the four hundred. I was like, nah, I'm good on that. I did, I did all of that, man. <laughs> I did the I did the high jump, um, and then I did the long jump. So those were my my three things mainly was high jump, long jump, and the um, one hundred and the two hundred meter dash. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, good times. How was the How was the home dynamic? Did you grow up with both parents? One parent? How was that? Yeah, that's what, well, um, and Haiti was a little bit different because our parents, my parents were actually here. They would actually go back and forth. So our mom um, was in Haiti for a while while my dad actually stayed in the U.S. And then eventually my my mom and ended up going back to New York and we stayed, I stayed with my uncle, my brother and I would stay with our uncle. And, you know, it's like, it was, it was a weird dynamic, but ultimately they were always together meaning that my parents were always together so that's the one thing that I can definitely say that we've always had both at least two parents and uh you know even if it was my uncle and his wife but we always had two you know two parents so to speak in the house in the home nice so we've always had that family and always a sense of um you know community and 
and, and belonging, so to speak. So yeah. that was always good. It takes a village, man. I think, you know, that's something that's another thing that's missing today is there's yeah. no villages anymore. You know, um, everybody's no, kind of, right. everybody's off right. to their own okay. thing. Hey, man, you worry about yours. I'm worried about mine. Don't cross over into my yard. And that's it. Like, I live on a street where I don't know anybody's name. It's just kind of wow. sad. You know what I'm saying? I live on a busy yeah. street here in the city of Chicago. So, but yeah, it's unfortunate, man, that there is no, there's no uh, community really anymore but that's good that you had uh both families in the house so was your dad was he big on sports your dad and your uncle was they were they big on no, sports not at all my my dad never seen me play believe it or not wow he never, because he really never watched football because that was not his sports so he never really watched me play so and I, I i didn't really think much about it because to me it was like okay i'm just having fun so i didn't really i didn't really need an audience it was more or less um you know, if he showed up, that's great, but he never really was interested in, in football, so never really watched me play. And it was kind of weird because it's kind of like the opposite when my younger brother got into school because he realized everything he had missed when I was there. So he trying to make it up with my younger brother by always going to his games. <laughs> wow. How many, yeah, sa- how many brothers and sisters you got? I got two brothers. I got an older one and a younger one. So I'm, I'm the middle child. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, middle child syndrome. I'm dealing with that over here yeah. with my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's good. So, uh, what things could you take from, before we get into, before we get into the college years, what things, um, what disciplines did you learn in high school? Um, what things, anything happened in your life that helped you to stay disciplined in, in, in the work ethic that you that you had? Um, well, you know, I, I have to um, give credit to the coaches because as a young man, you really don't know what to expect. There are a lot of things that you don't know about when you are either, you know, when you're growing up or just trying to understand the dynamics of society, the dynamics of uh, what it is that you want to do in life. Mm-hmm. And being part of a a sport and being you know having friends around you basically are in a position or in a situation where it forces you to be disciplined it forces you to just you have to go to practice you got to make sure that you have other people counting on you and you have coaches counting on you so now you know that you know that it's not just for yourself you also you know you also have others depending on you so you have to show up so by showing up you essentially are disciplining yourself to know that okay I just got to show up every day. What, ha- what happens next is, you know, sometimes it's out of my control, but just show up every day and do the best you can. And that same mentality is what you take in, you know, with, whether, it's a, whether it's a sport or whether it's, it's a job or whatever it is, you yeah. go with the same type of our mentality. Just do your best, show up, just show up. And, you know, you, you know that you're going to be the best. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what it is. You just come in and you just come in to work. And that has never stopped from, from anything that I've done in life. I usually basically take the same approach. I'm going to come in. You're going to have to beat me for it. And I'm not going to make it easy on you. I'm not going to make it easy for you. Just understand I'm coming into work. So whatever you do, that's your problem. But I'm coming in and I'm going to do my best. And my best is not to lose to anybody else. So <laughs> nice, nice. So you're, so you're super competitive in that way, huh? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily uh, boast about it, but I'll just internally, internally, I'll just go ahead and just make it happen. I know if you beat me today, I'm already thinking about how I'm going to get you the next time around. But I'm not going to tell you, though, because, see, I don't want I don't want you to get an edge on me. But you just but you're going to see it, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you take me as uh, what you are is a very humble, good, humble dude. I never seen you boast or brag about anything. So when you when I, when I met you in person, before I even found out about the football stuff, I like, oh, he's a nice, he's a gentleman. He's a nice guy. He doesn't come off as, as cocky. I know it's like you walking around with, you know, a Super Bowl ring or just being able to play in the NFL, period. Is there going to be a certain type of swagger that you have about you? You know what I'm saying? And, and <laughs> you don't give that off at all. It's, 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 it's real uh, humbling and it's good to see. But that's definitely a really good, um discipline to have and I think it's a dying discipline um especially in sports 
right? Like right. We, we see it. I, I watch a lot of basketball. I pay attention to a lot of basketball. So you see a lot of people, a lot of players not, they're making it all about themselves. You know what I'm right. saying? Oh, I, I ain't happy with this team and I'm sitting out. I ain't going to play. I'm not going to show up. Um, and it's like, yo, you're letting your team down. You know, you didn't, you know, you signed up to be a, a basketball player, but you also made a commitment to your team. And so I really appreciate you saying that um, and having that, that structure, that discipline to say, oh, I'm here, not just for myself, but I'm here for the team. It's such a critical, such a critical part. And it shows character, shows character. So that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, when did you, when did you um, know, like, I had the opportunity to go to college. Did you get a scholarship? Did anybody recruit well, you? I have an interesting um, story about that because um, out of high school, because I was a top hurdler out of high school and a top um, football player. So I was being recruited by football and track. And I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do because at first I was like, okay, maybe I might just um, give you know track a try. I wasn't sure because I was getting recruited by, because I had good grades, I was always an honor roll student and thinking that, okay, maybe, you know, I end up somewhere, but I was getting re recruited by a bunch of Ivy League school and thinking that, okay, maybe I might go to Cornell or maybe, um, you know, Princeton or one of those top school, but then Northwestern approached me. I said, okay, I guess that would be ideal because um, Northwestern University is right there in Evanston and that would be nice and, you know, I think um, at the time, my parents probably would have enjoyed it because I'm not too far away from home and, be, and I had the academics. So I'm thinking, okay, I'll go ahead and, and um, go to Northwestern. So all the other school that was um, recruiting me from Brown to U of I to, um, well, a lot of Big Ten schools, just a lot of school in general. And I had made a verbal commitment to the head coach to uh, who, who at the time was at Northwestern and, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to go to Northwestern. Okay, I'll, I'll make a verbal commitment. So that way I can, and when you make a verbal commitment, essentially you're telling the other school that, okay, I've made a verbal commitment. I'm going to sign with this school. So they'll back up and they'll give your scholarship to um, somebody else. And I remember the day that we had to sign the scholarship, the head coach essentially reneged on what he said. He said, you know, um, you know, we had this other player we were trying to recruit as well. So what you can do is come in the spring and we'll give you a scholarship there. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. So you made me say no to all these other school, nah. other schools. But right be the day right before I signed, you're going to tell me that you don't even have anything for me or that you're going to have me come in in the spring and I can pay for tuition for the uh, upcoming. I said, man, I said, I'm done with football. man. that's all right. That's all right. I said, but thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. And because I knew that I could get a scholarship for um, track, I was just going to run track. And the head coach that was, um, or one of the coaches that was at U of I, University of Illinois, he got the head coaching job at Southern Illinois. And you heard what happened. He flew in town the same day and offered me a scholarship right there. And he wow. said, hey. If you um and that and Coach Frio, which was my high school coach at the time, I'm not sure if they. I believe um he had co contacted them, and he flew in and just hey, I heard what happened. You know, we we're willing to just um offer you a scholarship right there. And I said, you know, I know I can get something for track, but just to be on the safe side, let me just go ahead and sign it. And I knew that hey, if nothing else, I can always play football, so it's all good. <clears throat> Nice. So I signed my, that's how I signed my football scholarship and just went to Southern. Wow. <laughs> wow. How did that, and it's I, funny, that, that same coach, yeah. I, I saw him at the combine and he was like, yeah, I remember you. I, I almost gave him the finger at the time. <laughs> the reason why I didn't is because he was with um, Tony Dungy at the time, who oh, was with Tampa wow. and he was recruiting and he was talking to me and, they, and they're good friends. So that's why I'm like, man, <laughs> you want to give a piece of your mind. I didn't, like, I didn't hey, see anything. I didn't you try to anything. play me, man. Me. You tried to play yeah, me. Oh, man. Yeah, that's. I had a, I had a great year, man. I, I have to admit, even my high school year, I ended up, um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about that because, um, you know, I think it's a great story when you talk about just how things happen sometimes and just the timing of it. Because my senior year, 
we ended up um, going to the Heisman, you know, trophy celebration when when Barry Sanders won it. So oh, wow. the, the third Heisman Trophy winner who actually came from Evanston, I believe his name is um, Clayton Frank. He went to Evanston. So he flew like five or six of us and the head coach to um, the downtown athletic club in New York and watched the Heisman ceremony. And and I, that's how I met Barry Sanders. And his room was like a couple, a couple doors down from my my hall, and we would just we would just talk all the time. So, nice. which is kind of, which is kind of crazy, but that's yeah. life, man. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so crazy. Um, did you have a favorite football player or anybody that you kind of patted your game after? I think I was more like Eric Dickerson because I was tall and fast and, you know, I tried to pattern my running style a little bit close to his running style. But but in the end, I, the player that I really admired and thought that was probably one of the greatest back was definitely uh, Barry Sanders because he was like in the league of his own. And yeah. I used to I used to have to mimic him all the time in practice. So <laughs> whenever we would play Detroit, man, we would have I would put on, you know, 20, the the, tw the number 20 on and I would act like Barry. So that way the defense could get used to at least have a have a pre <laughs> a pre um, game look of what Barry would, would be doing uh, whenever we play Detroit. So <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So. Now you're in you're in college. You're in uh Southern Illinois, right? Yes, Southern, Southern Illinois. You. How was that? How was transitioning from high school and now going to Southern Illinois, which is what is that? Like three hours from Chicago? No, it's about um six hours. Six hours? Uh, five and hour, five and a half, six hours, depending how fast you're driving. So <laughs> so it, it must be right at the border because it takes like five hours to get to like East St. Louis, which is right before exactly. St. Louis. Exactly. It's like almost at the tip, that, you know, southern tip of um, Illinois. So wow. that's what they call it, okay. southern Illinois. <laughs> okay. Okay. So how was, how was that? That was great, man, because um, when I first came in, I thought I was going to sit out a year, but I ended up not getting redshirted. So I played my freshman year. I played and I never got redshirted and I essentially, you know, played running, played tailback, you know, and it's not even a position that I played a lot in. The reason why I ended up playing tailback was because my senior year, one of my, meaning that on high school, in high school, that is um, our running back coach got hurt. He was a top running back being recruited and then he got hurt. He tore his, um, I believe his ACL and that was like, in the playoff during my senior year. And I ended up uh, basically replacing him. And, you know, I prior to that, I had been playing fullback. And I, when I replaced him, I ended up having like one of the most, probably one of the most amazing games that as a tailback you can have. And from that point on, it was, it was, it was as if people thought I was a running back and I've always been playing that position. I ended up, um, I had like four touchdowns. It was like 375 yards rushing. <laughs> what? It was like, yes, it was like unheard of. People were like, <clears throat> I think it was like total yards or something like that, but it was like unheard of. People was like, oh my God, what happened to, you know, the previous running back? And that's how I ended up being a running back. <laughs> wow. What's the, what's the key differences between a tailback and a fullback? Fullback? Fullback, you're mostly blocking. And usually, you know, you're looking block, you're blocking and you constantly down in a three-point stand, especially at the high school level. And it's usually the way us, uh, uh, we had an eye formation. So we always had the tailback in the back and the fullback in the front. And I would always block because that's how I started my uh, football career, so to speak, and never really thought much about it. And, you know, that's how I ended up being a running back <laughs> and, and going to um, Southern, man. And, and it's funny because at Southern, they put me at running back, but I really hadn't played that position. People don't realize that. I really hadn't played running back. Even though I was a running back, I could do it, but I really hadn't played it. But my best position was actually a defensive back, believe it or not. Wow. You know, as a defensive back, I was killing it, man. But they didn't recruit me as a defensive back. They recruited me as a running back. And I was trying to learn the position in college and trying to learn it, you know, as a freshman starting going, going against, you know, upperclassmen 
trying to learn a position. And my, you know, my coach was like, you know, I, I, he was trying to build the office around me and not quite sure how to do it. And at the same time, we had great quarterbacks and great, um, you know, classmates. It was just that I was, unex- you know, inexperienced in that position. Mm-hmm. And my sophomore year, he's like, man, we're trying to figure out, you know, how to position you. And, you know, they had recruited this, um, you know, this running back and thought that, okay, maybe let's see how, let's see how you fare as a fullback. So there I go again, being placed in the fullback position. They put me in practice. They had me run one play as a fullback. And we had this um, linebacker. He was like, you know, he was supposed to be like a decent linebacker, like a big linebacker, decent. So they said, okay, we got, we're going to run an, an ISO play. Basically, it's just you against that, run, against that um, linebacker and the tailback behind you. No kidding aside, first play. Ran, boom, put him on his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I place. I mean, after that, the coach didn't even say anything. I said, you go in the fullback. Just like that. And that's how I play fullback my, basically, most of my years um, at, the, at, at the collegiate level. So I played fullback and I really didn't play anything else. Wow. Wow. But I was an undersized fullback. I was, win- because I, I don't really have the frame for a fullback. I'm more like a receiver. I mean, tailback, yeah, but I really didn't have the frame for a fullback because I was small. Yeah. I was only yeah. um, six feet, you know, about 100, not, well, 205, 210 pounds, but I could hit. And what I would do is um, I would use my speed to try to just get leverage on anybody that was bigger than me. Yeah. So I figured, okay, I might be smaller than you, but if I go there fat, you know, at a decent speed, you're going to have a hard time stopping me. And that was, that was the advantage that I had. And I would always knock people on their butt because of that. You know, I would always use my speed and boom, and they would never expect that. So that was always my advantage. Nice. I was always know I was always known as the hard, you know, the hardest hitter. So people just like knew they were going to get hit whenever they had to go against me. So <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. I, when I play Madden, just if we ever play, I'm nice with the I formation. So, okay. Okay. So you know. <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, uh, do you play? Do you play games or no? Yeah, you know, I started playing back in the days. I was playing. I used to play Tecmo Bowl, believe it or not. <laughs> Tecmo Bowl was like the, you know, was uh, the game back then. But it was kind of funny. At one time, I started playing. You know, everybody played with Bo, Bo Jackson at the time. So that was like, he was unstoppable. And Hit the 99 rating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And eventually, you know, I think the weirdest thing was actually playing a bad, playing a tech mobile game where I was actually in the game. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, that is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. So do, do they, they probably didn't do it. Now I think they do it now. Cause they have to scan like face you and all that stuff. And now, but right, back in the right. day, they just would just add you in there. Yeah. They just had your name and, you know, and depending on your skill set, they would, I mean, I was always fast. So they, I, I had some speed boy. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice. Um, so college freshman year, you're playing. Uh, the starter got injured, so now you're in there, right? No, he didn't get injured. They just put me in there because I was, um, you know, I was doing better than he was. So they just put me in there because at the time they wanted me to essentially build the offense and try to just um, use me as a way to help to help us um, win some games. So gotcha, that's gotcha. the reason why I started. I started playing. How many games did you play in college back then? Um, I believe it's 11 games. 11 games. If you go to the playoff, then you obviously play additional yeah, games, play but more. it's 11 games. Okay. So were you like the like the, like the the big man on campus? Were you like really popular? Did everybody know who you were? How was college life? College was great. College for me was great, but at the same time, it was a lot of work because I majored in electrical engineering. So I always had a heavy study load or heavy workload. Yeah. So my days were, you know, was always tense. My freshman year, I struggled because I was trying to run track and try to also, um, you know, play football. And it was just got to the point where it was just overwhelmed. Yeah, the and I couldn't one. do everything, trying to keep my academics, trying to be, you know, uh, uh, a track runner, trying to be a, 
a football, I'm like, football player, I was like, ah, oh, that's just way too much. And I think I burned myself out in the process. So sophomore year, I just focused solely on just football and I didn't do anything else and academics and and my, I, I had some long hours, man. When it comes to my studies, man, I used to be up like one, two o'clock in the morning studying and then go to practice because you have to get up early and go, you know, lift weights. And then after that in the afternoon, you would go and just, um, you know, just just go to practice after that. So it was, it was constantly, constantly, nonstop, constantly, nonstop, man. But I enjoyed myself. Don't get me wrong. I had fun, too. I had fun, too. But I know it was work. It was work all the way. So you play you played all four years. You started all four years. Yeah, all four years. Never missed, never missed a game. I think I got injured one time and I really didn't miss a game. I, I played, but I didn't, I know I had I took some some uh, plays off, but for the most part I played all four years. All four years. Wow. Wow. Um man, that's that's sounds like I I I never had even a thought of going to college. It was never my thing. I was like, I want to just go for the skill that I want to go for, learn it, and then get a job. Uh, so college was, I know my mom, you know, she wanted me to go, but it was never like, yo, you, know, I had a desire to go to college. It wasn't like that for me. Um, I'm a like real just hands-on person. So I like to learn what I want to learn and get all the extra classes and taking all the, you know, I, I miss me with all that. And on top of that, you got to pay for all that stuff. So that was okay. definitely like, if I'm not getting a, a full scholarship, I'm not going. So uh, even though I originally went to um, college for a year uh, for okay. IT and then ah, nice. I had a kid and I had to make some adjustments. So, but yeah, I was definitely probably never going to go to like a big made university like that. Um I don't even know in my mindset that I had it probably would have been too too much for me. At that, I didn't have I didn't have the discipline to to make it through like that. Like it's, it's a lot of distractions I hear about how crazy college See, that's could where be. The discipline comes in though. So yeah, you know, that's that 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 discipline that you learn from playing sports and constantly just trying to keep a schedule, trying to make sure that you meet your obligations. So that's you know that's how it helped me tremendously. Yeah. Did you have a desire to go pro? You know, I really didn't think about it until my senior year when people started talking about it and said, maybe, you know, you might be a good candidate for this and that. And, you know, then I had um, um, my my head coach talk to me about it. He said, yeah, you know, my my agent, if you are interested in this is something that eventually if you want to if you want to if you want to pursue it, then. Yeah, you never know if you get that opportunity. My agent is here. He can definitely talk to you. And and I didn't know it, I, you know, my senior year, but I got invited to the combine. And that's when it's like, okay, since I'm being invited to the to the combine, and that's the one in Indiana, Indianapolis where all the major football players and everybody else go to get tested and what have you. And since I got invited, I said, okay, so I. I guess my my name is in the hat since I'm being invited to all the big um, you know combines at the time. So, but the one in Indianapolis was the biggest one and still is. And I remember going there and you know and it's funny because when I went, Jerome bit it because I was like the third running back, and I think I was um, or second. I can't remember. It was um, Jerome Bettis was right in front of me, and next to me the was the bus. Uh, <laughs> yes, the bus. And Garrison Hurst was like right next to me. So I was in between the bus and Garrison Hurst at the time. So he was kind of he was kind of cool. <laughs> and man. you go through a lot of tests, man. Oh my gosh. You go through a lot of tests. Was I it mean, they really they really just poke you and do just about everything just to make sure that you don't have any bad injuries or anything that can essentially um hand, you know um make your stock value go down before they invest whatever money they're going to invest in you. How, how is it intimidating? Was it intimidating? Cause you, you're playing, I'm pretty sure they probably had some big names, right? Like you hear their names in the headlines and stuff like that. So was it intimidating for you? It's, it's it wasn't intimidating because you used to competition. If anything, you welcome that because you want to see, you know, what you made of compared to other athletes. And like I said, at the time, all the big names, it doesn't matter whether it was a, uh, I mean, for running backs, it was us, but you had all the other quarterbacks and receivers, DB. I mean, you name it, 
everybody was there. So that was all the big name players that go to the Indianapolis combine. And even now, they still, you know, they still televise that because that's where that the big show usually happened because you see all the coaches from different organizations come in and this is where they basically talk to you and look to see what's happening and see what's going on. And you just got to do your thing. You can't worry about, you know, if this is, you just got to do your thing. You can't worry about anything. You don't, don't worry about anybody else. You go and just do your thing and you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool, man. Um, before we get into your professional career, Take us a little bit behind the scenes of these college politics, man. What is that like? Or did you experience any of that? I was lucky because my coach and I, we've always had a good relationship and I still stay in contact with him. And I never really had that problem because from day one, we've always had a, you know, a good um, connection and I played, I never really thought about anything in terms of bribe, in terms of our people paying you never really had any of that issue. So we had some good coaches because, put it this way, our quarterback coach was, well, Bill Callahan. He ended up um, coaching. It's a small world. People don't realize that. It's a very small world because I know he played at Philadelphia. You know, he was an offensive lineman coach at Philadelphia. He ended up getting the head coaching job uh, with the Raiders. And I think he ended up, he ended up um, going to different places, different coaching opportunities. And even our defensive um, back coach, he actually ended up um, winning a couple, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of Super Bowls, because I think he was with um, Pittsburgh for a while and he went to Philadelphia. It's, it's a small world because a lot of time you, you know, the people that you meet in your college years, somehow you, you know, at the pro level, you also see them as well too. Yeah. So it's funny because I ended up um, also meeting him when I went to Philadelphia because I was with them for, for a couple of months. And Bill, you know, Coach Callahan was there too, coaching the um, offensive line coach. And guess what? We played in college at the same at the same time. You know, nice. so it's all good. It's all good. And it's kind of funny because when I almost ended my, you know, when I was trying to get drafted, and at the time there used to be 12 round, and then they cut it down to what um, eight, I believe, seven or eight. So I thought I was going to get drafted by Detroit and it was going to be funny because I was going to be behind Barry Sanders again, <laughs> you know, and I had met him and I had met him thinking that, you know, okay, all right, we're going to, you know, this is going to happen, but it didn't happen, but I ended up going to Buffalo and Barry Sanders was the backup to Thurman Thomas, who was also at Oklahoma state. So Barry was behind Thurman and I ended up being behind Thurman, or not behind him, but at the time I ended up going behind, um, you know, at the, with the Bills and ended up eventually being behind him for a while until I got hurt. But it's just life, man. Sometimes it's just, you see how things just somehow are connected mm -hmm. and it just never um, happened the way I had wanted, but that's life, you know, sometimes it happens. It yeah. happens that way, so. Cool. How was, the, how was the family when you were in college? Did they see a lot of your games? Did they come visit you? No, my my father would probably, every now and then he would watch it on TV, but he never really, like I said, he never really was into football, so he never really watched my games. <laughs> so he would just he would just hear about it, but never really came down to watch me play or anything like that. And I was used to it, and I didn't put that on them. You know, it's just they're not. He's not a football. He's not a football fanatic, and my mom really didn't like. She didn't like me playing because she was always afraid that I, I was going to get hurt. <laughs> so she never could watch it. So it was always, it was cool. It was all right. <laughs> did you have any, did, did you have any friends? Did you have any friends from the neighborhood? Like, hey, look, man, when you go pro, don't forget about me. <laughs> well, it was nothing like that, man. Because I, it's like, I never really thought about it because no one ever seen me going pro because they didn't think I was, you know, I wasn't into football like that or thought I was good enough. It, it was almost like a shock to a lot of people when when I made it, at least from Everson, because no one really thought that I was going to go pro because yeah. they never really see me. They thought other players could have gone pro, but me, on the other hand, it was never something that people associated me with. It was like, oh, oh my God, I can't believe, oh, I didn't realize he was that good. Mm. It was almost like a surprise. <laughs> um. So 
college is over. You're going to get drafted. What, what position did you get drafted? As a running back. <laughs> well, I know as a running I'm talking about like what number? Around. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't get drafted. I ended up signing as a free agent with the oh. Bills. We were supposed, I was going to get drafted by Detroit, but at the time, that's when they actually cut down the drafts from like, I think it used to be 12 and they cut it down to like, I want to say seven or eight. So because of that, I didn't get drafted. So I ended up signing as a free agent with the Bills. What was that? What was that process like? Did you have to reach out to them to try out, or did no, or did, not at all? Because they had seen my film, they had seen because it, it was completely different back then. Because you had film reel that you you could send to recruiters, and you know I had gone to the combine. They were they had talked to my agent, and they were talking to me. Even my agent was telling me, "Yeah, you know, Detroit wants to draft you. You know, just we'll, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see when and what's going to happen." And somehow they ended up making a trade or something happened where my agent's like, no, I'm sorry, you're not going to Detroit anymore. You're going to Buffalo and they're going to sign you as a free agent. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it was just like, all right. I mean, I didn't even, I didn't even realize that was the process, but sometime, you know, deals happen behind closed doors. So. Wow. Okay. Okay. So now you're drafted. Now you're officially uh, a pro how what was that what was going through your head at the time you know you go to rookie camp and usually you go through the first you know uh rookie camp where it's like okay you, you you're meeting everybody and you know it's not not everybody's there but you're going you're doing your thing you're having a little fun and it's a different world I mean it's like you know now you are you are with the with the big time you are with the you know with the professional athletes and now again it goes back to competing it goes goes back to just everything that you basically are used to, which is um, competing. You just competing against big names and people that you used to see on TV that, you know, heard, you heard about, you just go in and do your thing. And, you know, you meet everybody, you hang out, you try to get to know a little bit in terms of that. We call it mini camp, but it is what it is. You know, you're trying to get ready to go to, um, you know, training camp, which is usually like a few months later and try to at least um, get your playbook, whatever you need to do so you can get ready so you can compete. And you get a chance to feel for who your, competi your competition is and you go and try to um, try to earn a spot. Oh, okay, wow. So how was that, how was that process for you? Like, um, was it, go ahead. Now I was gonna say, I mean, it's a great process because as uh, you know, you go, to, you go through training camp now, training camp is a whole different story because now you're coming in, you got veterans who's, you know, who have been there for a while, and obviously you're coming in to try to earn a spot. So they're fighting, they're fighting for your, you know, we both fighting for the same position. So you got to make sure, yes, we're friends, we, you know, we colleagues, but at the same time, uh -uh, don't get it twisted now. You want my job. So if, if you get this position, I, I'm out of a job. So yeah. it's one of those things where, uh-uh, we got to, you know, we got to, keep it professional, but at the same time, you know, fights, fights would happen all the time. You know, it's a grind, man. Every day you gotta come in, you gotta learn, you know, X number of plays, you gotta go out and you gotta perform. You can't afford to make mistakes because you have, remember, you're not a starter. So a lot of time you're watching and a lot of time you might, you might be going against the first defense and, you know, they'll take shots at you because, you know, you're expendable. You're not a high draft pick, so they're not gonna protect you. So you just got to go in and do what you got to do and, and constantly every day. You can't afford to get hurt because, you know, the saying goes, you can't make the club in the tub. So if you get hurt, you're out of there. So you got to wow. compete, compete, compete and, and not worry about it. And every day you come in, you don't know if this is your last day because any minute now they can call you, boom, boom. And they usually come get you early in the morning, man, like around 3, 4, you know, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., you hear that knock on your door. <laughs> Coach wants to see you. That's it. And you got to come in and, you know, bring your playbook. That's it, man. And you have a you have a, um, a roommate. So especially, you know, both of you are like, okay. And you can hear, you can hear the knock. Sometimes it's not you. So you're like, okay, all right. I survived another day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, but that's, so this is that's the name of the game. So this is training camp. So training camp, you, you you guys all stay together and like uh, yeah, assuming the same hotel, whatever. No, no, no hotel. Usually you you go to some like small college or wherever your training camp is, 
and everybody's in the same, you know, dormitory, so to speak. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Everybody's there. So you usually have your roommate and whatever people around it. You hear you hear knocks all the time, especially right. when you're close to closer to the beginning of the season where you know they got they're gonna have to start cutting people all the time. And you just like, man, this I just hope that it's not me. You're like boom, boom. And when you go to practice, you look around, and if you don't see your boy, then it's like, okay, I guess he's you know he was cut. So. Oh you just, man! You just, you just think for that it's not you, and then you go and you gotta you gotta go ahead and and deliver on that day and and be productive and it's like hey you do you do your best and I can only imagine it's so different because like with cell phones wasn't like a big thing right when you were playing I think they had what the little maybe a flip phone maybe still have the, maybe the brick phones or something right. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. I said maybe the brick phones or something. What was it? Uh... Yeah, yeah, we had those. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't like somebody was like you was texting back and forth with your agent or nothing like that. It was just like exactly. get the so knock on the door. What, you didn't know what was gonna happen, so it was like you know you do your you do what you gotta do and you wait and you could even really get a good night's sleep because at the time you don't know if they're gonna come. You know, <laughs> knock on the door, and sometimes they'll come knock. And it's not for you, it's for your roommate. Oh, but you don't know. You just man. Like, it's like the two of you are in the same you're like, oh come on. And you're like, okay, this is it, man. And you're saying <laughs> this. And if it's you, it's ah. But if it's your boy, and sometimes it could be something minor. Coach just wanted to talk to you about something, but you don't know. A lot of time you go, you don't come back. <laughs> Dang. Anybody ever take that walk? Like they got the door, okay. Coach wants to talk to you, they get all their stuff, but they just want to talk to coach and they come back. Nah, it's like you go, you don't know. If they, if they tell you to bring your book, and you don't know. Because sometimes they'll call you, but it's not a cut. They'll come talk to you because they see something and they want to share something with you. And that's it. But you don't know what's going to happen. You <laughs> just don't know. That's nerve-wracking. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, you get used to it. It's like, this is good, um, man. You make so, the best of it. So after you made it through uh, training camp, I'm pretty sure that was a big uh, relief off your shoulder. Like, oh, I made it. Um, now, I, I got cut, though. So I got cut. But the way that, you know, I ended up being on the practice squad because they have to cut you first and then bring you back. Oh, OK, OK. So tell me what that process was, was like. Well, it's like they tell you that, you know, this is what's going to happen. And we're going to have to release you. But it's just the way that the process works. We can't keep you on the, you know, we can't keep you on the roster if we're not going to keep you but we have to release you and see if any other team wants to, wants to get you. If they don't want to get you, then we'll bring you right back. You know? So you get cut for like maybe a day and then they bring you right back, but it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you can get picked up by somebody else or you can just get cut and they don't have to bring you back. Mm. So they, so they cut you, but then they brought you back. Yeah. It was like a scene. So I went home for a day and I came back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, and then um, how long does uh, – when does camp, training camp end um, in light of uh, the season starting? Um, it's usually like the week before the season starts, right? a week to two weeks before the season starts. I mean, okay. usually it's like the week before. That's when you'll make the final cut. And then um, after that, you go right into the regular season. So now it's like, okay, now it's, now it's for real. So, you know, it's you got to do what you got to do. Whatever you came in to do, you got to – you gotta come out and do it. So uh, do they do they let you know like, hey, you're your starter or your second string, or do you actually do you have opportunities to to you know where you stand? No, trust me, you know where you stand. They will tell you, hey, first group, if it's not you, guess what? You know where you stand. They got second group. So you know where you stand. It's not like you're not sure. This they're not gonna tell you that. You already know who the starters are. Right. Because they know. Plus, unless you like uh you know, unless you're like a, a rookie, like a high draft pick, and you may not know, and you and you and you might be playing or taking some, um, you know, some um, um, some handoff or whatever, some plays with the with the first group, you may not know, or they might be testing and trying to see who's who. But trust me, everybody else know if you either are starting or you or you're a backup or you are or you're not playing at all, so, or you're yeah. a third backup, so. Yeah, that's what I meant, like, when, you know, you go to practice, sometimes you have a really good practice, and then you're like, you know what, we're going to start you this week. There's none of that going on in football. That's a good way. It's like, hey, you, you had an amazing practice, but you're still third string. Go sit down. Oh, yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, really wow. oh, that's, 
No, it doesn't work that way. So it's unless some, less, unless somebody gets injured, you just got to be ready to go. Yeah, unless somebody get injured or perhaps maybe somebody else is not playing to what they should be playing. They're like, no, nah, you shouldn't be. Uh, uh-uh, uh, that's it. That's it for you. We're gonna give this person a chance. So, but you, you pretty much know where you stand every single day. They're not gonna sugarcoat it. And what people don't realize, a lot of time as a rookie, the coaches don't really talk to you as much. Because the reason why they have to cut you, they don't want to even, they don't even want to get to know you. you wow. Know? So it's like they don't necessarily always like the process, but you know, I, I understand why they do it. It's because yeah. if they have to cut you, they don't want to be attached to you and get to know you and then have to cut you. So a lot of times they don't even say hi to you. They just like, you know, straight ahead. I'm like, man. oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah I, I, I heard I heard stories, man. It's real cutthroat in the NFL. It, it's a professional. It's it's a business. People don't realize that you are you are working, even though, you know, you leave all that have fun thing behind. Yes, you can have fun. But usually if you're not a if you're not a starting player, it's not like fun, fun. Oh, let me just have some fun. It's not like that. It's work. You come. You just go to work. It just happens to be in front of, uh, you know, in, in front of um, a live audience, TV and whatever. But at the end of the day, it still work. It's just a different type of work. Wow. So what did the what did the Bills have you do your first year? Uh, My, I played whenever I see I used, I used to go against the first defensive um, line. I mean, first um, defense. So whenever whenever they have to practice, I would run the opponent's play. So okay. I would learn the opponent's play and that's what we would practice against them. And every single play that they would say, hey, this is what they normally would run. And then you go and they'll give you like a chart of whatever plays and they'll show you and then you go run it. So that way we get the first um, defense ready and offense on the other hand would go against the the third of, you know, defensive, defensive um, player. So you constantly Constantly, you're not stopping. You're constantly, um, you know, playing and going back and forth. Whether it's kickoff return, punt return, you do it all. It's wherever they need you. Yeah, I seen. I was looking at. I was looking at some of your stats. Um, I seen you had a lot of. Uh, what is this kick? That kick return? Yeah, kick yards. Return. Yeah, kick returns. And That's I used to do that. In, you know, in high school, I didn't do it in college. But it's like one of those things that you have to adapt to because you don't know where you're gonna end up. You know, if you can do it, you can do it. If you can't, you can't. But I'm like, hey, whatever, what, whatever you you need me to do, let me let me find a way to get it done. You ever had a you ever had a return for a touchdown? No, I, I had one close. I almost uh, broke it, but I never I never got a touchdown, man. <laughs> they, I think the return went all the way. But they caught you like at the within the five yard line or something like that. It was like in the 30 yard line. And, and the thing is that the way that I got caught, I got caught from, I had passed the, I had passed the kickoff, the, the kicker and this last guy. And I wish if I had cut in the inside instead of the outside, it would have been a touchdown, but I cut in the outside instead. And as I was about to pick up speed and someone just ah, tackled me from behind, man. I'm like, oh, well, it is what it is. <laughs> Talk about the game speed, like the difference between, you know, high school and you got college and you got professionals like the game. I hear a lot about the game speed. Talk about that. It's so much faster than the pros. You don't even have time. It's like it's everything is a reaction. You see, at the high school level, you can play different roles because you're going against players that may not be as talented that especially if you're a good player, you can get away with a lot of things Mm -hmm. at the college level. It becomes a little bit tougher, but you can still do it. And but at the pros, everything is so fast. Everything is just timing. You have that's the reason why timing is so important. Just that you have that chemistry with that quarterback. You have chemistry. That's why sometimes it's very hard if you don't, it's very hard to you know to try to build some type of chemistry with a new player because you have to have your timing and practice. And a lot of time, you as a as a uh, as a starter. You don't always get a chance to practice with someone who's like a second string or a backup, you know, like a third string. You don't always have that timing, right? So when you're in the game, sometimes it's this the timing is a little bit off because it takes time to be able to get used to it. 
I understand you're supposed to go and just make it happen, but there's a timing factor that you also have to take into consideration that unless you are in the game doing it, you're not always going to get that timing right. Wow. That's why you have, you know, um, new rookies, it takes time for them to get the pace of the game, to understand how fast it's going to be able to at least adjust to it. If you don't know, usually it's, you know, it takes time to do that. You're not as effective the first couple of plays. And the difference between a starter and a free agent is that a starter will have multiple practice, multiple chances to be able to deliver. You as a free agent, you don't have time to be able to get those practice reps in. You just got to go. <laughs> wow. You just got to go and just make it happen. You got to be ready all the time. And with, with people that you don't practice with. Right. So, man, that's a that's a lot. So you got to make sure. I mean, you for a, a running back, you got to make sure the timing is right with the quarterback, where he's placing the ball. Timing is everything. You can get away with it because you're an athlete, but timing is everything. You have to know how what this person sees and what you see. And you and the quarterback, you know, have to be on the same page. And people don't realize that how important that is. If you see it, if you see um, a defense that, okay, you, I have to be able to know what you're thinking. So that way, when you make your adjustment, I know the reason why you're making it. If you, do, if I'm not on the same page as you, you know, it throws it off a little bit. Yeah, I was, uh, I was watching the playoffs this year, and there was some rookie he came. In, I forget what team, but he came in. He looked like a deer in headlights. He was like, people were pointing at him. <laughs> He's looking like. Right here, you want me to go here? <laughs> he was right. like a loss. He was like, it's happening fast. They don't give you time to think. That's why you practice. You practice to the point where it becomes second nature. Yeah. You don't have time to think about it. You just have to react to it. That's the difference between when you are ready and been doing it for a while. You don't even have time to think about it. You just react to it. Versus if you're trying to understand, let me see, where do I go? What do I do? It's too late. You had yeah. you had a disadvantage, and they yeah. know it too. Yeah, because yeah, it was a, he was a defensive player, and so they right. just the offense was like, "Yo, he's lost, let's go," and they just called yeah. HUD, and then it was it was on from there. But um, so you're um with the team. How did they like prep you guys? Because I'm pretty sure they were talking about, "Oh, this is a year we're trying to win the Super Bowl." What was the atmosphere like in the in the locker rooms and just with that team? Everybody has their own ritual that they go through. And the thing is that you don't say, well, this is a Super Bowl. You're just trying to win every game. If you just win, trust me, the rest will take care of itself. But you got to worry about that, the game that you know that in order for you to get to the next game, you just have to win the game that's, that's, that's you're playing in today. You can't worry about Super Bowl. You can't worry about any of that. Hey, let's win. And if you win, the rest will take care of itself. You know, and luckily for me, I was fortunate to just be there and participate and be part of that and was great to enjoy it. But at the same time, we do understand, hey, it's um, it's, it's a do or die situation. You know, you don't get you don't always get a second chance. But, you know, this was like their fourth chance, All right. All right. <laughs> you know, four times in a row, same situation. And people don't realize they had to come back, not my year, but the year before, they came back from the biggest deficit in history to go yeah. back to the school against the Houston Oilers. People yeah. don't realize that. It wasn't an easy, you know, cruise, just, you know, easy um, transition every single year, easy cruise in and make it to the playoff and to the Super Bowl. They, they earn it every mm -hmm. single time. Yeah. So... I know for 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 the players, they probably had that mindset like, you know, we got to win next game up. But did the coaches or the organization add any pressure to you guys, like talking to you guys about going to the Super Bowl? Listen, we got to do it this year. And if they did, how did that you as a player, how did how did uh, how did you adjust to that? You have different. Um, I want to say pressure, depending on who you are and depending on your, I guess, the number of years you've been playing. You have those who, okay, I want to have a legacy to show that I'm, I was great at what I did, so I need a ring. I need to be able to show that I, I can win the big one. Not everybody was playing at the same level. You have players that they want to be able to show that they can win the big games. 
then you have other players that, you know, hey, I'm trying to get my bonus. I'm trying to make sure that, hey, I end this year in a positive note that, hey, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm gonna make it. I'm, I'm not, this, this might be my last chance. I don't know if I'm ever gonna play again. So let me make the best of this. And you have players who are like, hey, if I, if I can do great this game, if I can do great now, I'm, I'm definitely gonna end up somewhere. I wanna be contract. You have people playing for different reasons, but ultimately you wanna be able to play to win that game because that's the only way you're gonna get the recognition. You're gonna be able to at least um, continue the path that you're trying to see. And once you win the big one, that's when it's like, hey, finally, I can just relax a little bit because I've, I guess, you know, I got a championship, especially with the Bills, because they had been there so many times in a row and they hadn't been able to close the deal. And that's what made it frustrating. So, yes, they had a lot of pressure. You know, everybody had a lot of pressure on them to try to find finally win that one Super Bowl that the city wanted, that the owners wanted that everybody as part of the organization wanted. Mm. So we had to try to win it. Yeah. So, and did you, did you take a snap in that Super Bowl? No, I didn't take a snap. I was on the sideline, but sideline. you know, Hey, that's, sometimes you don't find, you don't know if you're going to play until the very last minute. It's like, you're not dressing up, you know, you're going to dress up instead, depending on if somebody's hurt or somebody's not hurt. It all depends on what happens. You you just never know what's gonna happen until until um the last minute. Were you dressed? Were you dressed? No, I didn't. I was I was dressed for a little bit, but then it was like, nah, I'm sorry, you can't. <laughs> ah, um, it's, it's one of those. It's like you don't know. It's like, well, get ready. You just never know. And okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So you mentioned uh, you know players talking about you know bonuses. Is there any truth? To any given Sunday, you know, you remember that movie, Any Given Sunday? I remember that. <laughs> LL Cool J was yelling at the coaches and other players talking about his bonus money, and he needs to get this many amount of catches and all that stuff. Was how, how much of that movie was being played out in your experience in the well, NFL? At the time, what you have to understand, a lot of those guys they sign contract and they get bonuses based on achieving a certain thing. If the team makes it to the playoff, you can get a bonus because of that. If um, you know, if you make it to the second round of the playoff, then you can get a, another bonus because of that. If you make it to the AFC Championship and you actually win that, there's money tied to everything. So a lot of time, you don't know what that is for that player. It could be they're close to making maybe 50 catches, you know, for that season. If they make, if they make that one catch, that's that could be an extra million dollar bonus for them. People don't realize that. And I know for sure I had, I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but one of my, he wasn't a running back. He was another player. And I remember by making it to the payoff, his bonus was like 1.3 million for making it to the payoff. So I remember he said, hey man, can you hold this for me? He was teasing me, but I was like, okay. <laughs> wait, wait, but wait. He told you to, he asked you to hold what, his check? Check. He was. I mean, obviously, it's his check. I, I can't cash it. I, can't I know, but it. I'm just saying that's funny. It's... <laughs> but yeah, and I saw his check. It was like 1.3 mil. That was that was his bonus pay for making it to the to the playoff. Wow. That's what I'm saying. It's serious money. So you don't know what's going on by just you know by that person saying, "Hey, I need to get my cash, or I need to um, I need to reach a certain whatever." You know, because his his bonus may be tied tied to that. So yeah, there's a lot of there's were a lot you, of truth. Were you eligible for any of those bonuses? No, I was not eligible. That's <laughs> something that has to be part of your contract before you even. Oh, for real. so it's yeah. mainly for like veteran like players who've been in the league for a while. Oh, yeah. Oh okay. yeah, exactly, exactly. So like everybody on the team, like if we make it to two ball, everybody doesn't get a, a bonus or any type of extra pay. Not like that, no. Wow. <laughs> well, you do get a bonus, but not like it's not similar to everybody. For example, you might get like maybe you know ten thousand if you make it to the first round. If you make it to the second, you might get maybe twenty five. But it's not everybody across the across the board gets that. It could be certain players that get that, but not everybody. You know. So obviously, if you're a star, you 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 probably get a lot more than that. So it's not even across the board. Yeah. You can have somebody making you know, 3 million, but then you have somebody else making close to a hundred thousand. That's it. Yeah. The big gap, but you still part of the same team. 
But check, trust me, the checks are not the same. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Star players are going to get paid, you know, like stars. And I know that, you know, this was 15 it was a long ago. time ago. It was a long time ago. So I know that the salary cap and everything was a lot different in the NFL than it is now. And so I know they're they're still fighting for like play. I think the 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 smallest salary in the NFL right now is like five hundred thousand, right? For probably the lowest wow. player on the nobody. In on my the day, you get like a hundred thousand. Yeah. Yeah, it was completely different. Trust me, it was not like it is today. <laughs> so, so you being a person who didn't dress, you were, were a third string running back. What type of guarantee money do they offer? You ain't got to give out numbers, but like you had no guarantee. You want to realize that you had no guarantee. They don't. They didn't have to pay. Keep in mind that everything is guaranteed in your pub, but not in theirs. They don't have to pay you anything. Were they paying you like on a week to week basis? No, 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 not in a week to week. In a week to week, I mean, you get some money. Don't get me wrong. It's whatever, whatever your contract was. You know, you pay, you get that in a weekly basis. But it wasn't a case that you're making a whole lot of money. Put it this way, um, I, I, I could, I could make more as uh, working my profession that I did as a professional uh, in management versus what I made as a football player. Wow, yeah, that's, that's what I was. That's what I wanted to get to. Like, well, it's like, don't get me wrong. You you can make some money, but if you look at at the time what you were making versus what you make as a professional, you could make more as a professional now than what I was making back then. Wow, it's not that much money. It's just that you associate with a lot of money, but your time has to come. That's why you can see now. It's obviously it's a little bit different now. But back then you had people making like, you know, 110,000, 105, 100,000. It's not even a lot, or oh, even 90 some thousand. It wasn't a lot of money. It wasn't everybody making a lot of money. Yeah. It was just that once you get your big payday, then you could make that money. But it wasn't like that for everybody. So, yeah, yeah, I know that, that that's the battle that the NFL is still fighting right now, the players, and they're trying to get more money, even insurance for after they retire, you know, to be oh, able to. That's- have health care and stuff like that. I don't realize, I mean, I've had friends that, you know, that have taken their lives. So it's not, it's not always, um, people don't get to hear the other side of that story where when they are done, you know, in terms of um, dealing with pain and, and, you know, the, um, the, the head trauma that they've experienced once the game is over, you know, I, I can say that I'm fortunate that I really never had any major injuries. And in terms of a um, concussion, I remember just having one concussion you know, from even though I played from my never missed a game from my um, high school year all the way to the pros, I've only had one concussion, and I wow. played a lot. And I'm a hard hitter. Don't when I say a hard hitter, everybody knew me for that. Yeah, whether it was high school or college, even in the pros. And it was a different league of hitting back then. They can't hit like that now. You can't hit like that now. But back then, you could hit, and I, yeah, you know, that's. It's, it was the name of the game. You know, you get hit in every direction. Man. And it was, it was constant, 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 constant. Oh, wow. So, so you guys go to the Super Bowl. You didn't win it, unfortunately. Um, how was things for you after the fact? Like going into the next year, what was your role on the team? Um, and how did it eventually come to um, yeah. you at the end? Yeah. Well, you know, um, my third year with them was like supposed to be my my day where I was backing up Thurman. I had a great year. I, I was in great shape. I was ready to just uh, make my mark. I had been working so hard. I was just, um, you know, getting ready. And second day of training camp, no kidding. I went for a pass. It was like, an, it was an easy route. It was like, go eight yards, plant, come back and catch the ball ran, stopped, planted, and my calf just popped. <laughs> Second day of training camp, and that was it. And I was hurt from that point on until the last week right before, right before, um, right, before the tri- right before the season started. And like the saying goes, you can't make the club in the tub, man. That was like, you know, I had signed up. That was supposed to be my new contract year, my new everything. And just like that, boom, that was it. 
You know, it just happened and I couldn't do anything about it. I was hurt and I tried to practice a little bit, but I couldn't do anything. And after that, you know, they got me on film trying to practice. And the next day he was like, you know, sorry, uh, we have to release you. And I said, okay, that's fine. I understand. You know, this, you know, I ended up um, sitting out a year after that, um, practicing and trying to get back in the league. And over the summer, I ended up going to Philly. You know, I was at Philadelphia for a while. I was like two, two to three months practicing, learning the plays. And they went through a draft pick. Once they drafted their, um, their halfback, I said, okay, I was the third back. After that, I knew my time was up because once you pay somebody, you know, whatever, um, half a million or a million dollar in terms of a first draft pick, there's no way they're going to keep me over that person because they don't want to look bad. You know, even if, even if you're better than that person, they would never want to look bad. So I just knew my time was up after that. I they got to pay. They got to, they got to make sure that their investment plays. They're paying him to play. So exactly. they got to. Exactly. Yeah. So I knew my time was up because uh, I could tell when it didn't matter what play I ran, there was always something wrong with it. You know, and I could tell when a coach is just giving you a lot of, you know, a lot of BS because every time you run a play or oh, you didn't do this right, you didn't because what it's a it's a mental thing. They're trying to break you down mentally. So that way. So when they have to release you, they can say it's because you weren't good enough. But that's really not the case. It's just that they they have to justify the reason why they're keeping another person. Yeah, that's all it is big business and, you know even it got to the point even other players like man that's don't don't worry about that I mean, that's a bunch of bs we know we know we know you you're good man don't even worry about it it's just something they do i mean i used to have players come to me and tell me that you know and wow. the first round he couldn't do no wrong i mean he would drop the ball didn't even run the play right when i say nothing <laughs> nothing at all they didn't even it was, oh, yeah, good job. Next next time. You'll get him next time. Okay, come on. You can do it again. Uh, oh, my God. It's uh, me on the other hand. Don't you can't even you can't even walk. You can't you got to run. I mean, you couldn't do anything right. Even if I breathe, I couldn't breathe right. <laughs> <laughs> it was, was, oh, my gosh. That was just crazy. I mean, we that's that entitlement, man. We see which is now full blown in our generation right now. Um, yep. Players feeling, in, but people in general just feeling entitled, you know what I'm saying? And not really having to work hard. Everybody get a participation trophy now. Nobody has to, 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 to earn it. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's rough. And so dealing with the injuries, you leave the league. Uh, now what's next? What do you, how do you, how do you uh, transition? I wasn't done with football yet because I wanted to try because I didn't like the way that it ended. I wanted to because I knew I had some more playing in me and I wanted to try to at least some get back in the league. And I had talked to my agent and trying to figure out a way um, to still play. And right after I was done with Philly, I ended up um, going to the CFL. I played for the um, Hamilton Tiger Cats. Oh, okay. So I played in the Canadian League. So I played there for a year. And... Um, it was kind of weird because, you know, I had played for them and I did great. I was supposed to come back the next season. And I went to, uh, to I went to a camp. Basically, it's like a little mini camp for, for coaches that were looking for, you know, for players that wanted to get back in the league. And the uh, recruiting person, uh, the general manager for my Canadian team was there, was there, was one, in one of those camps. And I was running routes. I was, you know, I had a lot of coaches come to me and say, man, okay, I see that you're doing this. This is good. Can you do this? Can you do that? The general manager got mad. He was like, well, you shouldn't be doing that because, you know, we have you. I'm like, yeah, I'm just running some routes and, and you know, trying to see, you know, where I fit in. I was like, you know, I got to take my chance. If I can get back in the league, I don't care, you know, whatever. So I, I kept on playing. I kept on practicing and, you know, come next year when I went back to the Canadian league, you know, he was like, you know something? Okay, fine. I'm going to, I'm going to cut you because of that, because I ended up playing some, uh, running some additional routes in that mini camp for those, um, for those um, scouts. He ended up cutting me when I went to um, back to the, to the CFA or so. Oh, I wow. said, okay, it's, it's a dirty game. It's a dirty, it's a dirty game, but it is what it is. 
that's that's the nature of it, man. That's the that's the part that people don't know about. <laughs> when you when you got when you left college, when you graduated, you graduated with a degree. Yes, I went back while I was playing. I went back and got my degree, so I got okay. my engineering degree. Um, after my first year with the Bills, I went back and got my degree, and then um, and then and then went back. Okay. It took me two summers because I ended up. Um, I took some classes, some elective that I needed to to um to get done. I took some at Buffalo, and then after that, um, when I went, I went back to school for just a couple classes that I needed to take, back to Southern, and then after that, I graduated, and I was good to go. After that, I got my degree, came in the mail. I say, hey, I made it. I got my degree, man. <laughs> it was all good. That's cool. So, after after the Canadian League, you were officially done with football? Oh, I was done. I, I I just didn't have it in me anymore because, you know, constant, constant traveling, constant, constantly just trying to, you know, figure out where you're going to go and travel to different cities and try to make the team and you're constantly working out. And it just got to the point where I didn't really want to uh, continue to do that because I felt like it, the fun, the fun wasn't, wasn't in it anymore, you know? Yeah. 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 So I was um, done with it. Okay, so next chapter in life, no more NFL. How do you transition? What do you do? Man, transition is not easy. <laughs> that transition is a beast. I mean, it's crazy. Oh my gosh. Uh, I remember just I'm um, going through, I went through so many, so many um, you know, job fairs and tried to put my resume out there and try to get a job and you know, I'm thinking that okay, I got I got I got an engineering degree. I've always been, I've always done well in school. So this is what they talk about. You know, have something to fall back on, have a degree, and this and that. I was going to all types of job fairs and handling my resume. And the fact that I play football, people love talking to me, but they would never offer me a position. I've talked to so many companies, they would interview me on the spot, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, tell, tell me about the game, so what did you do, how was oh, it? Oh, they trying to me. get inside the stories, bro, they didn't even offer you the job. Day, no, I was, I was willing to do interns to it for free, I was willing to do anything, I said, I don't have the experience, but if you give me, the, I'm willing to just work for free so I can get the experience, and once I get the experience, I'm more than happy to just work, and I don't have to necessarily, you know, start right away making money. I'm okay with not even with doing like a three months intern. Just give me the opportunity to. I mean, I was talking to all types of recruiters, people that work for the those organizations, and they were more interested in me over the fact that I play football and wanted to know, wanted to hear some stories, but never would offer me anything, man. So that's that was probably the one thing that I didn't expect. To the point where eventually I just would move my NFL resume completely everything i had done with the nfl i removed that from my resume completely that's the reason i say you know let me start over because i understand it's great if you're going for an athletic job but if you're trying to go into the working world to try to establish yourself and do something that wasn't gonna that wasn't gonna help me i wanted to try to go into the engineering field because that's what i had studied i couldn't get a job to save my life <laughs> uh, so how long how long did it take you to get a job I eventually just um, just got a regular job. Um, I saw an ad in the newspaper, and I said, "You know something? I'm gonna start from the bottom." And I just filled it out, and I went in, talked to the manager, and that was a job in the cable company. The newspaper? I, What's that? What's the newspaper? I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back, back then, you know, you 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 had to check the uh, the wanted ads. <laughs> Somebody, so I'm pretty, my, my, my daughter, she probably, I tell her to go get a newspaper. She'll be like, what's that, daddy? Like, she probably <laughs> bring me her phone or something. Like, you want to watch the news on my phone? What are you talking about? Newspaper. Oh, yeah. man, that's, that's funny. <laughs> newspaper. Wow. Wow. So. Because, I mean, I got a newspaper. That's how I started um, back. And, you know, from there, it basically same mentality. Go in and do your job and be effective and coach and try to excel at it and slowly move up. And that's how I ended up moving into management and years later into um, upper management. And doing that is basically keeping that same mentality. It hasn't changed. It's like you go, you take everything that you've learned as an athlete that 
constantly competing, it doesn't matter what you have to face. You're constantly competing, you know. Yeah. And it's the same thing, whether it's whether it's here or a different, um, um, you're moving to a different state, starting all over. Same mentality. You are a competitor. You're gonna compete no matter what put yeah. you in whatever environment you're in, you're gonna compete because that's what you were, you've been created to do. Just compete, 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 nonstop. Nice. So did you stay in Buffalo after the NFL or did you move back to- oh, I, uh, I actually ended up moving to Georgia because uh, okay. I wanted to move to Georgia and wanted to try to establish there for a while and then really work out. <laughs> well, <laughs> what did you like I, about Georgia? Why Georgia? Uh, Georgia at the time was just uh, move, you know, was just growing, and a lot of people were talking about just how how um, exciting it was to be in Georgia. And I had bought a house there, and I thought that this was like the place to be because so many people were moving there, and it was growing, and it was exciting at the time. And what I found was that everything was just so far because I had gotten used to just being in Chicago, where it's like you don't have to drive that far to you know to the go to go to the grocery store, or even get any type of fast food. But Georgia at the time was like if you had to go get a burger, it was like a forty-five minute drive just to go get a burger. I said, "Oh my gosh, I can't do this." I said, <laughs> "This is this is not gonna work for me." <laughs> <laughs> because it was still, you know, it was still growing. So everything was just far. And we stayed in Marietta, Georgia. So I said, we couldn't do it. Yeah. So I had to move. Went back to Illinois and got another job. I went to uh, ABT. I'm not sure if you're familiar with our ABT app, Electronics. ABT. Okay. It used to be, they used to be in Martin Grove, but now I think they moved. I don't know where they moved to, but it was like a big, um, electronic um, place that I ended up um, going there and learning and, and and trying to make some, you know, just try, just trying to start over too. Before I, before I went to Philly, that's where I was working. And then I ended up starting over and getting, uh, getting into, getting into the cable industry. So. Okay. Okay. Wow. Wow. That's a, that's a lot. That's that's funny. Enjoys a 45 minute that's, drive. That's a lot of man. You just have to make the best of what you've been given and try to make the best of every situation. You don't know where life is going to take you sometimes, but you really have to know what you know, what you can do, and know what you know what you do best, which is compete and not look back. You can't worry about what happened in the past because that's not going to feed you. You just got to continue to move forward. You know, it doesn't matter what background you have as long as you have the mentality to continue to move forward, continue to compete, continue to improve, continue to, um, you know, to be, um, to do well and do better and try to just outwork everybody, you know? And I've learned a lot in the process too, in terms of um, investing, in terms of helping and giving back. That's the reason why people say, why are you so humble? What is, at the end of the day, you know, you realize that we are human beings. We are trying to make a difference. We are trying to make it to some capacity, to some degree. Anything that you can do to help others, to help others reach their potential, you do that. You know that's why that's why I've coached. Whether it's financially, I've coached. Um, you know, athletically, I've always been a coach and constantly trying to give back so that way others can actually um, achieve whatever goal they want to achieve, whether it's financially or athletically or just uh, in terms of um, personal personal wealth or personal health, whatever it is. It's always a great thing. Nice, nice. That that's that's amazing. I see you with the what's that says legends. Com what's this? Oh, oh legends shirt? community. <laughs> what 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 is that? Are you still like plugged into the Bills organization? What's going on with that? Yes, I'm still plugged in. Every now and then, you know, we hang out. Uh, I haven't been to any game to any games, but I can always go back and you know get a cup. You know, go into a couple games, but I. But I still, I still uh, stay in touch with my, with my, you know, with my former teammates. And as a matter of fact, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was um, out with um, our center, uh, Adam Langer, and also, well, funny Jeff, Jim, Jeff Cody used to play for the, he used to play for, um, for, for Dallas, because he won, he won the Super Bowl with them, the one that they ended up beating us twice in. So we were hanging out and just catching up and, you know, old, with old, good old time, just catching up a little bit. So a lot of time it's always good to just go out and just catch up with some old teammates and just check on each, check on each other to make sure that we're good. And if there's anything that's, you know, ailing us, we, we share that too. So, so it's nice. a good thing. Mental, you know, mental health, man, is something that 
I know it's not talked about a lot in terms of um, um, what athletes go through after the fact. I know it's talked about that. It's talked about now more than before, but it's something that we do to make sure that we stay in touch with each other to try to check in with one another. So, so it's all good. Yeah. Do you think that the the league should change the some of those policies when it comes to uh, uh, the the pain pills and, and and certain drugs that they ban? for the health and wealth of these players? Well, I know that it's changed a little bit since um, I played. Um, I can understand that, you know, you, you have guys that are bigger, faster. So I'm sure with that, the injuries can be more severe too because you don't have, you know, my, back in my days, yes, you had a lot of um, injuries and what have you, but at the same time, you you know, now you have faster guys, you have bigger guys. So when you, when that constant hit keeps happening, it does, it does, it does take a toll on you. And I don't know what's been, what's not been. All I know is that there are a lot of players who are suffering. And if we don't always bring attention to that, but the, but the league is doing a better job of reaching out to at least former players. That's the reason why we have those communities where at least some, we can, as a group, you know, talk to one another, check on one another. If we have to catch a game, we know we have a place to go to. And, you know, that's good to see. Now, is it enough? Compared to what's happening behind closed doors, I don't think it's enough. I think I think there's more that needs to be done because, you know, you might see a few who are doing well or who are doing okay. For everyone that's doing well, there are several, there are, you know, dozens who are not doing so well. So... Mm -hmm. And a lot of time, people don't see that. People don't see that side. Yeah, that's good, man. That's good. That, at least it's good that you get to talk and catch up with some of those some of those guys. That was going to be one of my questions, but you answered it. But I do got some fun questions that I want to ask you uh, <laughs> before I let you go. I'll take up uh, yeah, sure. some of your time over there. I want you to get back to you know the family. Um, what hobbies do you have um, outside of sports? Outside of sports, wow. Um, I much well. I I used to trade a lot, so I you know in terms of investing, I love to invest. I love to uh, make sure that uh, I can you know I've written several you know I have a like a workbook that I've created based on my investment strategies, and I can help people become successful in that. And I even have a website that my wife and I have created where we can teach other people to be able to at least um, do that as well. But my biggest hobby. You say outside of sport, but what I love to do is run. I'm a runner. I've always been a runner. So I still run till this day. I go out on the track. This is where I find my peace. I can go and I get a couple miles in. I get a couple, you know, some fast laps, 200s, 100s, 400. I get them in and I feel so great afterwards. I can't stop that. I, you know, when it comes to just biking, that's another thing I love. And every now and then I love to just read different things, but I just love just the whole aspect of just uh, making a difference. And at the same time, mental health, which is why I run. I wanna make sure that I keep my, not only physically that I feel good, but just so that way I can give my kids a chance to at least see daddy get older and still have it all intact. <laughs> yeah, amen, that's, that's good, definitely. Um, I got another one for you. Um, what is your greatest strength? My ability to solve problems. Okay. One of the things that I I've always you. been great at puzzles, which is putting things together, which is why when my wife is watching a movie, she's like, I can always tell her what's going to happen before, before it happens. And I'm one of those people that I don't even have to see the whole movie. I can tell you just a couple of shots. Hey, I, this is what's probably what's going to happen. I can even tell you to the point where I can even see the words they're going to say, which is scary sometimes. When they're watching a movie, and I say, and I say the word before the actor even say it. I I tell them the ending before it even happened. He said, "How did you know that?" I said, "All the clues are there." Wow. I said, "All the clues are there. If you just pay attention, this is what they're gonna tell you next. This is what's gonna happen next." And ninety nine percent of the time, it tends to be true. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, is there a player? Um, is there a player that has left um, or has made a great impact on your life? A player? 
To me, I think that Barry Sanders by far has been the player that has made an impact because I've met Barry in so many different aspects of my life. So not only in high school, but even in the pros when I play against him. And the way that he left the game, he left it on his own terms. He could have gone after all the records if he wanted to because he could have played at least two or three more years, but he chose not to do that. He left on his own term, and he also left, you know, at a time when most players wouldn't have left, you know. You know, you have people going for records. Oh, I got to get this. I got to get that. But it all depends on the justification behind it. So with him, if he had played as long as he had played compared to other players, he would have had just about every record in the book. Mm. Imagine if Barry Sanders had the lineman that Emmitt Smith had. Wow. Do you, can you imagine how? That, that would have been some special. There's just no way Emmitt would have had that record. No way. Don't get me wrong. Emmitt is cool. I, you know, it's all good. But there's just no way Emmitt would have had the record of being of having the most the most yards. Just no way. Wow. No one would have ever beaten that. Not in this lifetime, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right, last one I got for you is, what do you believe is the greatest challenge athletes face today? The greatest challenge is, I think that is specializing in a sport at, at a young age. They don't get a chance to explore different opportunities anymore because now it's much harder for them to be able to explore different talents because they are specializing in sports at such a young age to the point where it's, I think they miss a little bit of their childhood of their life because yeah. by the time you are four or five, you already are so far indoctrinated in a sport that you don't even know anything else. I've seen, and it's not so much the kid, I think it's the parent, yeah. Because they want the parents, they want their kids to be the best. They want their kids to be, you know, a top athlete. And a lot of them are getting hurt to the point where by the time they're even older, they can't even do the sport that they truly would have been great at if only they had started a little bit later. Not that it, they can't get the fundamentals, but you push them to the point where they are breaking down before their time. You know, you have kids playing football at four or five, or you have playing baseball and they're throwing their shoulders out or they're getting the ACL, all types of injuries that could have been prevented if they had just waited a little bit longer. Not yeah. that they shouldn't have the fundamentals and practice and what have you, but it's just like too serious for them at a young age and they don't get to choose anymore. They don't get to have fun. So, I mean, think about it. If you had, if you had a young age and you throw it into soccer, you throw it into baseball or whatever it is, or basketball, it becomes, that's the only sport you're gonna do. You don't do anything else outside of that. Even when I used to try to work with coaches at, you know, at, at high school to try to get them to go out for different sports, they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even accept that. They wanted that kid to basically all year round practice one sport. I'm like, that's not fair to that kid because you don't give him a chance to compete. They don't know how to compete. They have become, you know, good at one thing, but sometimes they don't know how to compete outside of, of a sport that you may not necessarily be the greatest in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're an athlete, you're gonna compete no matter what you face. It doesn't yeah. matter if you are the best athlete out there, but you're gonna compete. But when yeah. you've been playing something that you've been playing at such a young age, yes, you're gonna be, you're gonna be great at it. You're gonna be good at it. But outside of that, what do you know? Can you hold your own in another sport? Can you hold up? Can you hold your own in something else? You probably don't. You can't. You don't know what it's like to not do what you've been doing all your life, and yeah. that I think sets them up to fail in the long run because they only know one thing and nothing else. Yeah, um, man, that's so true. I just watched literally this little kid. He's amazing, little little kid. He's like seven years old. They got this dude doing um, NFL drills. Yeah, like. Like he's leading out practices by himself. His dad, I think his dad played college ball, maybe a year of the pros. I can't remember his name, but now he's coaching his son. But he's like, I don't know if this kid has fun. And I, and I think what you said is that I think it it does take away from the fun of the game because it becomes like a business or it becomes like I have to do this or 
I'm going to disappoint my dad or I'm going to disappoint my coaches and it's, it's not fun anymore. So by the time they get to the pros, they've been doing this their whole life. It's like, hey, I'm going to do this, get some money. But the, the, the fun aspect of it is gone. It's if they get to the pros, it's not a guarantee. That's the, yeah. that's the part that people don't see. For every one athlete that made it, there are thousands that thousands, didn't make it. Thousands. It's not just, I, I understand you want your kid to be the best and give him a chance. But at the same time, you don't want them to miss out on their childhood and they not make it at the same time. It's like, yes, you can train them. You can, but let them enjoy life too. They don't have to be, they don't have to do one thing and stick to that. And that's all there is to it. Not everybody's going to be a Tiger Wood. It's not going to happen. I understand that a lot of them started young, but the majority of the young athletes you see are big, they didn't just do one sport. They did multiple sports. You probably know them for one. I mean, look at uh, Mahomes. He was a baseball player for crying out loud. Baseball player. Football. Allen Iverson, my favorite player, yeah. basketball player. He played basketball. football and played basketball. Yeah. yeah, Michael Jordan played baseball, played basketball. People don't realize they played multiple sports, which allowed them to compete. It wasn't just one sport, and that's all there was to it. Mm -mm. They don't see that. They don't see that. And I think it helps with the mental as well, because you're, you're in a different you're in different environments. You're mm -hmm. learning different skills. You have to be able to think quickly, like learning, you know, oh. what we were talking about, impulse and learning how to uh, make certain moves and be able to, like basketball, basketball is like, I know the NFL is fast so and I, I I never played, you know, football at that level or anything like that, but I know I played basketball and I played it just on a high school level and it's, it's, it's go. It's not like you get time to think and sometimes the point guard can set up a play for you or something like slow it down a little bit. But when you got your defense coming at you running full speed, it ain't like looking at the coach, like, what do I do? Like, no, you got to go and make a play on the ball or, or do something. So I think, man, you know, a lot of these kids, man, they're missing um, the opportunities to, to have fun, to, to really just build up a love for the game, a passion for it, to be able to do other things. Like I told you, we played all the games in the backyard, right? We, uh, you know, soccer, baseball, basketball football we played we did we played all those games we learned how to play them and uh we just had fun with it we were free with it it wasn't no pressure it wasn't like hey you gotta gotta make it i'm gonna train you up it's that fun like you said yeah 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 so yeah i think that that's that's that that's really good um yeah man i really appreciated this conversation man thank you for taking the time away from the family and on this uh saturday I know you're in the South, so you got some good weather. I'm out here in Chicago, man. We dealing with 15 degree weather over here, man. So, uh, oh, wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's ugly out here. I was uh, at work yesterday. It was like so many car accidents because uh, we had a 48 degree day. So that melted all the ice. Right. Decent day. 48 degrees, we barbecuing in Chicago. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> so it melted all the snow. So it was an amazing day. And then the next day, we got three inches of snow. <laughs> wow. I don't miss that at so, all. On top of all the water, the ice that just melted, it turned into water. It froze. So it's black wow. ice now on then three yeah. inches of snow that fell on top of it. So yeah. people are losing their minds. They don't know how to drive no more when, when the stuff happens. So it's like, ah. Um, but wow. yeah, man. But uh, again, appreciate your time. Thank you for Take a time as your busy day away from the boys, away from my sister. Tell them I said hi and I love them. And um, man, keep doing what you're doing and um, stay encouraged, stay safe out there. And uh, we'll be talking again soon, man. Thank you for your time. Not a problem. I sure appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, no problem, man. Have a good day. You too. All right, bro. Hey, thank you guys for staying to the very end of this video. This was a long one. This was my first official interview i've never interviewed anybody i don't have any training in this so this is all coming off the cuff man uh hey if you guys got any improvements um for me any tips critiques drop them in the comments man and as you leave those comments make sure you like the video subscribe to the channel it's me dairy this is the weird perspective i'm out god bless y'all until the next video peace